Hello, friends. Steve Stockton here with you. Welcome to Episode 8 in our Creepy Cases series. Although many of the cases we cover on the channel have at least some bizarre or strange element to them, these are five more hand-picked cases we feel have the highest creep factor. Join us. Damien Nettles The Isle of Wight sits just off the coast of England and is accessible by ferry or by hovercraft. With a population of just 141,000 as of 2019, it's safe to say that the Isle of Wight has a tight-knit community where everyone knows everyone and also everyone's business. Those from the UK are likely very familiar with the case of Damien Nettles. The Isle of Wight is a part of the United Kingdom, so news quickly spreads, and while the Isle of Wight has its own council, it's policed by both the local Isle of Wight police and the Hampshire Constabulary, who operate on mainland England. The 90s were a different time for young people growing up in the UK. The Spice Girls had a vice grip on pop culture, and everyone wanted to get their hands on a pair of trip pants or those Adidas popper pants. But as the millennium slowly drew closer, the UK became exposed to the horrors that lay underneath the facade of prosperity and a thriving cultural scene. In 1996, Damien Nettles was just 16 years old and living in Cowes on the Isle of Wight. Damien's parents, Valerie and Edward, felt comfortable allowing their teenage son to walk around the streets, knowing that the island was relatively safe and that there were many people to look out for him. The night of November 2nd, 1996, would change their perception forever and force parents on the Isle of Wight and mainland UK to hold their children just a little tighter. On that day, November 2nd, 1996, Damien and his friend Chris headed out to a party in East Cows. Valerie and Edward had agreed that Damien could stay at the party until midnight, giving him more freedom while also ensuring that firm and safe boundaries were set. Before he left, Damien called his girlfriend, who lived in Suffolk, on mainland England, to tell her he missed her. This would be the last phone call that the young couple would ever share, and just hours later, multiple hearts would be broken. After being at the party for some time, the two decided to leave early and head for the nearest shop where they bought some cider. The legal drinking age in the UK was 18 in 1996, as it is today in 2022, so it's unknown exactly how they were able to purchase the hard cider. It's not been detailed whether Chris was 18 or whether the two had fake IDs or maybe knew of a shop that would sell alcohol to the underage kids. After presumably purchasing cider, Chris and Damien headed back over to West Cows from East Cows. Now, if you don't have a car, the only way to get to West Cows is to catch the ferry. So the two boarded the ferry for a short trip and landed safely in West Cows. As they had left the party early, the two wanted to try their luck, have a bit more fun, and try getting into a few pubs. But as they were 16, they were denied entry. With a cool crisp air and the time being 10.30 p.m., the two wandered down the high street, pondering what to do. For Chris, the night was now over, and he practically begged Damien to walk home with him. The two walked together as far as Northwood Park, said their goodbyes and see you laters, and parted ways for what would be the last time. Chris later recalled to the BBC, I went straight home. I was 100% sure that Damien had headed up through the park towards home. But Damien hadn't. Instead of heading toward his home on Woodvale Road, which would have taken him around 27 minutes to go the 1.4 miles, Damien had turned around and walked back down into Cows High Street. CCTV footage shows Damien at the Yorkies Fish and Chip Shops buying a bag of chips before leaving. The timeline of when Damien purchased the chips is somewhat muddy, and sources cannot agree on a definite time. Sources have also stated that Damien had entered the chip heap beforehand and left without ordering anything. During this first visit, he seemed to not understand what was being asked of him and appeared very confused when trying to order food. Witnesses later came forward and told the police that just before that, they had seen him trying to open the doors of a blue Ford Fiesta and that he looked either intoxicated or very spaced out. The last sighting of Damien was made just after midnight on November 3, 1996, and according to the Island Echo, it's known that CCTV picked him up elsewhere on the high street some 25 minutes later, but this footage was lost by police at the time. Damien's parents were expecting him home by midnight, 
And while Damien was navigating through his teenage years and expressing himself by wearing Doc Martens and listening to grunge bands, he was said to be a generally well-behaved and polite boy who always stuck to his curfew. As the morning of November 3, 1996 rolled around, Damien's little sister, Melissa, went into his room to find that there was no sign of him. She noticed that his bed had not been slept in and immediately called her parents into the room. Even though she was just nine years old when this happened, she still had the sense of mind to know that something was not quite right. Valerie and Ed immediately picked up the house landline, fiercely punching in the numbers to Chris's house. They heard to ask him if Damien was there or if he knew where he was, and that was when his heart sank. Chris had to regrettably inform the Nettles that he had not seen Damien since the night before when the two had parted ways at Northwood Park. Understandably, a sense of panic and urgency washed over the Nettles, and after calling around Damien's friends and looking for him themselves, they went to the nearest police station to report their son missing. Unfortunately, the police were incredibly negligent in Damien's case, and the missing CCTV footage would not be the first mistake that they made. According to Valerie and Ed, the Isle of Wight and Hampshire Constabulary did not embark on door-to-door -door inquiries in the wake of Damien's disappearance. In fact, it was them and their friends who held themselves together and walked up to strangers' and neighbors' doors, asking them if they had seen their son. With the police forces failing to act and failing to take Damien's disappearance seriously, Valerie and Edward stood strong, gained composure, and began their own efforts, something that no parent or loved one should ever have to do. According to a BBC article written in 2016 titled Damien Nettles, The Boy Who Disappeared, it wasn't even the police who found the CCTV footage of Damien at the chip shop on the night of his disappearance. The BBC article states that Valerie knew Dr. Corin Lawrence, who at the time was a counselor or MP, legal system representative, and had good standing and some authority to do some digging. Thanks to the due diligence of Dr. Lawrence and the tenacity of the nettles, the CCTV of Damien's last moments were uncovered. If left to the police, the footage would have likely been destroyed or taped over before they even had gotten the chance to view it. Dr. Lawrence told the BBC, The police wouldn't do anything, so I took it upon myself to walk down the street, asking left and right to see if anyone had seen him. The man in the chip shop just told me that he had this little camera above the door and that I was welcome to look. Dr. Lawrence also discovered that, while buying chips, Damon had spoken to five men, and by all accounts, it appears as a friendly conversation filled with small talk. All of this information was, of course, handed over to the police and the BBC, and Dr. Lawrence alleged that the police failed to interview any of the men in the chip shop that night, meaning valuable information was lost to the sands of time. While the men might only have been able to tell them that Damien was confused or drunk and that they exchanged friendly banter, there was also the possibility that they had other important information, too. With the Nettles family and their friends pushing the police to take more action, insisting that something terrible had happened to Damien, the police took the stance that Damien had likely fallen into the water and drowned. Valerie rebutted this, telling the police that out of the two routes Damien could have taken home, he would have likely taken the route through the houses and not along the seafront. Remember, this is the Isle of Wight in November. Temperatures were low, it was raining, and there was a strong gust and spray coming in at the seafront. The housing estates were more likely to be lit up with lamps and the glow of lights from houses, so it's more likely that if he had tried to make it home, he would have taken that route. For quite a while, the police stood by their convictions and insisted that Damien likely fell into the water. The Nettles, their friends, and other family members and members of the public continued to put pressure on the police, however, urging them to open an inquiry. Finally, after discounting the Nettles' family, describing Valerie as a hysterical woman, and turning a blind eye to witnesses, the police finally changed their stance. In 2002, Damien's case was assigned to the Hampshire Constabulary's major crime department, and the investigation immediately changed course. Sadly, though, vital evidence had either been lost or simply not recorded at the time of Damien's disappearance, leaving the investigation with many gaping holes. Many people, including Damien's family, believed that he met with foul play, especially after one anonymous tip came in shortly after the case was handed over. Damien's brother believed that he had gotten himself involved with drugs, mainly cannabis. In 2002, a man came forward claiming to have information about what happened to Damien 
on that fateful night in November. According to this witness, they saw a notorious local drug dealer, Nicky McNamara, pinning Damien against a wall and later throwing a punch at him. Allegedly, the two had gotten into an argument over cannabis, and there was speculation that Damien was possibly in debt to Nicky. This witness went on to tell investigators that Damien's body had been hidden in a house for weeks before it being buried near a cycling path somewhere on the Isle of Wight. Armed with this new information, extensive excavations were undertaken in 2011, but so far, no sign of Damien has ever been found. Capital FM ran an article regarding the excavations, stating, Hampshire police set a search for his body and other evidence at an address in Marsh Road, Gunnard, finished on Wednesday, November 2nd, with no evidence or remains being found. Officers also carried out a search for Damien at Dodner Nature Reserve near Newport, but nothing was found there either. The address in Marsh Road was sealed off on a Tuesday by staff from the force's major crime department who worked alongside a dog support unit, scientific services, and the island support unit. A fingertip search of the property was carried out, and the ground surveyed inside and outside the address, while the back garden was excavated and victim recovery dogs were used. In total, some eight people have been arrested and then released without further charge in relation to Damien's disappearance. Damien's family have been highly critical of the police failings in his case following his disappearance in 1996, and in 2005, Valerie launched a complaint with the Independent Police Complaints Commission. Unfortunately, Valerie was met with little sympathy here, too. According to the BBC, Valerie was told that the officer who had lost the tape had already been dealt with. The issue was once again promptly swept under the rug. There are a plethora of theories in Damien's case. Did he fall into the water? Was he intoxicated and lost his way? Did someone perhaps slip him something that caused that state? There are so many theories and so few answers in this case. The rumor mills in the UK continue to churn, and for Damien's family, each new rumor and article drags up painful memories. In their minds, Damien is forever 16, full of hope and promise. Valerie told Hampshire Live, I just want the truth. And I do feel maybe somebody on the island is aware of what happened to Damien, because very little happens on the Isle of Wight that somebody doesn't know about. I'm just hoping that maybe, one day, somebody who is out walking their dog finds some bones, or somebody digs a hole and finds some bones. We are still in a state of limbo, of not knowing where he is, if he is still alive, what happened to him, was somebody else involved, or did he fall into the sea? We just don't know. Valerie regularly updates her blog and the Facebook group dedicated to keeping Damien's case alive. She is also championing a new law called Damien's Law, which aims to improve existing guidelines and encourage cohesive collaboration and communication between all parties to preserve the life of the missing person. Valerie is currently running a petition via change.org, and it requires 10,000 signatures to be discussed in Parliament. Please sign the petition and help Damien, Valerie, and thousands of other missing people in the UK get access to the correct resources. Anyone with information is asked to contact the Hampshire Constabulary on 101, non emergency number, quoting Operation Ridgewood, or you can text them on 077 814 80999. You can also contact the UK Missing Persons Charity at 166. Zero, zero, zero. As an alternative, if you wish to remain anonymous, you can contact Crime Stoppers UK at 0800-555-111. Next, Jean Virginia Sampere. Jean Virginia Sampere, a Getson indigenous Canadian woman, grew up as the second youngest of six siblings in Gitsigukla, BC. According to her siblings, who doted on her and her daughter, the love was mutual, with Jean playing pretend nurse, displaying her kind and caring nature towards those in need. Life for the Samper children was not always easy. Jean's siblings would later state that their parents forced them to work hard and that their father had a problem with alcohol. Even though she was the second youngest, Jean stepped up into the caregiver role, and suing her siblings felt loved and had their needs met. By 18, Jean was getting ready to spread her wings and fly. She'd gotten herself a job at a canning factory and had made plans to move out with her brother. 
The two could taste their independence at the tip of their tongue, but just as they were about to take their first steps into adulthood, tragedy struck. Since that day in 1971, Gene's siblings have never stopped looking for and hold fond memories of their time together. Shortly before Jean disappeared, her boyfriend had disappeared, leaving many to believe that Jean took her own life due to being distressed by this loss. Not much information is given about Jean's boyfriend, and all we know is that his remains were discovered after Jean disappeared and that he had drowned in the Skeena River. It is not known if the two incidents are connected, and the RCMP have never expounded on this. The night of October 14, 1971, would be one that would change the lives of the Samper family forever. In recent weeks, Jean's demeanor and personality had changed. While she was said to be shy and reserved, she still had a lot of love to give to her family. She had gone from a loving 18-year-old to a depressed and sullen one, and given the disappearance of her boyfriend, it's easy to understand why. Between 10 p.m. and 11 p.m. on October 14, 1971, Jean walked out of the family home for what would be the last time. According to those in the house, Jean had been tearful and reserved. When someone tried to ask Jean what was wrong, she said she was fine and simply walked out of the house and into the night. Her mother didn't try to stop her and remarked something along the lines of, she'll be back. But Jean didn't come back. This sullen and sad exchange would be the last that the Sampares ever have with Jean, and within a matter of hours, their world would be turned upside down. This was not the last sighting of Jean, however, and the last person to see her alive was her cousin, Alvin. After walking out of the house, Jean headed towards Highway 16, which is now known as the Notorious Highway of Tears, where dozens of indigenous women have gone missing or been murdered. According to Alvin, the two spent time hanging out on a bridge close to Gitsagukla, talking and enjoying the spectacle of the night sky above them. As the night wore on, a cool air began to move in over the town, and Alvin decided to hop on his bike to head home and grab a jacket. Alvin turned to his cousin, told her that he would be back shortly, and then pedaled away towards town. Only a matter of minutes had passed before Alvin began cycling back toward the bridge where Jean was. He told investigators that as he was approaching the bridge, he heard a car door slam shut. When he got to the bridge, Jean was nowhere to be seen. She had mysteriously disappeared, forever, in the few minutes that it had taken Alvin to get a jacket from his house. When the morning of October 15, 1971 came around, and Jean still hadn't returned home, her mother went down to the Gitsagukla Indian Band Office to report her daughter missing. Unfortunately, like many, Jean's mother was told that she needed to wait 24 hours before filing a missing person report. During this time, it is likely that valuable evidence and witnesses were lost. It wasn't until two whole days after Jean had last been seen that her disappearance was finally reported to the RCMP. Indigenous communities and the RCMP do not have a good relationship with each other. Given the history of how the RCMP is treated and continues to treat indigenous people, it's no surprise. There's a lot of racism and hatred towards indigenous communities, and for too long, the fact that indigenous women are at a higher risk for violence has been ignored. After Jean was reported missing, the RCMP launched a search for her in the surrounding area and the town of Gitsigukla. While the RCMP and others searched for eight days, no sign of Jean was ever found. Roddy, Jean's older brother, told the Vancouver Sun, I think the whole community took part in that search. There were people cooking and others in the bush. They came up with nothing. Her sister, Winnie, also added, It was just so strange how she disappeared. Everyone looked and they didn't find anything. Not a piece of clothing. It still feels like it happened yesterday. After eight days of the community banding together, the search was called off. Jean's family continued to desperately search for her on their own, but even now, in 2022, no evidence has ever come to light to lead them in the right direction. According to a national inquiry into missing and murdered indigenous women and girls report about Jean's disappearance in 2017, the RCMP had closed the case in 1985, although the report contradicted itself and also stated 1995, under the assumption that she had drowned. From statements made by Roddy and other family members, it does not appear that that was ever communicated with them or the rest of the family. In the report, Violet, Jean's sister, can be quoted as saying, and Roddy got a call at home just a few days before we were actually told what day to be here. 
and the RCMP wanted to meet with him and his family. And we actually met with him yesterday. Now, we're supposing that date is September 26, 2017. And he shared with us that the file was closed in 1985 or 1995. The other shocking information that he shared was that our chief counselor and others, I'm not sure who the others were, there were no names mentioned, had gone to the RCMP detachment and told them there were footprints found at the Gitsugukla River and that they believed they were hers. Violet also said, so we didn't even know about it. So this was something that really, really shocked us yesterday and was very upsetting to find out that your chief counselor gave assumptions to the RCMP that our sister had gone into the river. To me, that's assuming that our sister went in the river and drowned and they never told the family. The report in its entirety is available in PDF format online by the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls website. However, even with this inquiry, no solid evidence has ever come to light, and the Sampar siblings are left wondering what happened to their sister. The RCMP collected DNA samples from Jean's family to perform a comparison against Jane Doe's found at Robert Picton's farm, but it appears that no matches have been made. There are numerous theories in Jean's case, and the strongest is that she is another victim of the infamous Highway of Tears. Her family told the Vancouver Sun, It would be nice for us to have closure. If she's alive, it would be nice to see her again. And if she's gone, it would be nice to put her to rest and have a feast and put a marker up. Anyone with any information is urged to please contact the RCMP's New Hazleton Detachment at 250-842. 5244. Next, Georgina Garshala. As of March 7, 2022, 30-year-old Georgina Garshala has officially been missing for four years, and there's still no evidence to suggest what happened to her. Her family have been very critical of Sussex police, who would later admit that mistakes were made in the initial investigation into Georgina's disappearance. Her case has now been upgraded from a missing person case to a murder inquiry, but four years on, we still have no body and no evidence as to what happened to Georgina. Born to Libyan and English parents, Georgina enjoyed a multicultural upbringing, learning Arabic and immersing herself in her father's Libyan culture. Her mother, Andrea, described her to the BBC as quite streetwise, but quite naive too, very sociable, but had social anxiety. Georgina was a bright light in her parents' lives, and now, while they should have been celebrating birthdays, they are celebrating anniversaries of her disappearance. On March 7, 2018, Georgina left the family home in Worthing, West Sussex, for what would be the last time. Georgina and her two young sons had moved back into the family home following the breakdown of her relationship. According to her mother, this hadn't been the first time that Georgina had moved back home following the breakup of her relationship. She told the Telegraph that around age 15, Georgina became rebellious, smoking cannabis and drinking with her friends. It appears that Georgina was easily influenced and was guided by the wrong people who frequently led her down the wrong path as a teenager. Georgina had also struggled to hold down a job and was currently receiving benefits from the job center. With the breakdown of the relationship, Georgina was looking to build herself back up again and get herself a job in an office to be able to provide for her two children. Even amid this breakdown and unemployment, Georgina was still a devoted mother who would do anything for her two children. She had moved back into her mother's house, knowing that it was the best and most stable environment that she could provide at the time. Her mother, Andrea, also said that while Georgina was a devoted mother, it wasn't unusual for her to spend time at friends' houses but she always made sure to call her sons and speak to them. So when March 7th and 8th and 9th came and went and there was no phone call from Georgina, her parents knew that something had gone horribly wrong. It wasn't unusual for Georgina to be gone, but what was unusual for her was to not be in contact with her children or her family. In the coming days after March 7th, 2018, Andrea begged the Sussex police to take her daughter's disappearance seriously. But unfortunately, they did not. At first, it appeared to them as though Georgina had gone off to her friend's house and that she would be back in her own time. As the days went on, Andrea persisted, telling them to check the activity on Georgina's phone and bank accounts, and that is when the reality of the situation hit the police. 
Georgina's phone had not been used, nor had her bank account been touched since March 7th. Her ex-boyfriend and her friends also told investigators that they had not had contact with her since that day. Ten days after she was last seen, the Sussex police officially opened a missing person case, an investigation that was ten days too late. When retracing Georgina's final steps, they found her on CCTV in Worthing Town Center at around 9.50 a.m. On the morning of March 7th, Georgina had complained to her mother that her phone had been acting up, so she intended to dash into town to get it fixed and also planned to swing by the job center while she was there. Later that day, Georgina was also due to meet up with her father, but she never showed up. CCTV footage shows Georgina inside a shop talking to the shopkeeper about her phone. He pointed her to a phone shop across the street, telling her they would be better assistance in her case. The two exchanged polite goodbyes, and after that, Georgina simply dropped off the map. Leads were chased down to their ends, but nothing ever came of them. Over 90 reported sightings of Georgina were examined, but again, nothing came up. By August 2019, the Sussex police officially changed Georgina's case to a homicide, with DCI Wollstenholme stating, sadly, I have had to consider the possibility that Georgina has come to harm at the hands of someone else. A number of vital inquiries to test proof of life have been conducted, but to date, none of these have been able to exclusively show that Georgina is alive. We know this has been incredibly difficult and upsetting for all of Georgina's loved ones to hear, but it doesn't mean we've given up looking for. We still have a dedicated team of officers who are committed to finding out what happened to Georgina and giving her family the answers they deserve. The Sussex police are still following every line of inquiry that comes across their desk, but unfortunately, little progress has been made in Georgina's case. There are numerous theories out there, but without concrete evidence, it's difficult to say for certain what happened to Georgina. Her mother believes that Georgina may have been abducted and possibly trafficked due to her trusting yet naive nature. This is a possibility that no mother ever wants to face, and we hope this is not the case for Georgina. Georgina's missing person posters were distributed around the UK and were seen in towns and cities across the North and South. Her family put forward a complaint against the Sussex police, and the resulting inquiry found 27 key failings in their investigation of Georgina's disappearance. This inquiry found that Georgina had not been placed on Interpol's watch list until an amazing 18 months after she disappeared. There was also the issue of Georgina's disappearance not being logged until 10 days later, which the Sussex police have admitted was a major flaw on their behalf. With the fourth anniversary having just passed, Georgina's mother is growing more and more desperate for answers. Andrea and her family have also set up their own investigation into Georgina's disappearance, and they are running a GoFundMe to help raise funds for their investigation. You can find the link in the description if you'd like to contribute. In a heartbreaking interview with the BBC, Georgina's mom, Andrea, said, I don't want to die not knowing what happened to my daughter. Crime Stoppers UK is currently offering a £10,000 reward for information that leads to an arrest or the whereabouts of Georgina Garshala. Georgina Garshala is described as a mixed-race woman, five foot two with dark hair and a Monroe piercing on her left side. Georgina speaks Arabic and English and was last seen wearing a fitted gray coat with white faux fur trim. Anyone with any information is asked to please contact the Sussex Police at 101 or 01 273 470 101. As an alternative, if you wish to remain anonymous, you can contact Crime Stoppers UK at 0800 555 111. Next, Mary Denise Lands. 39-year-old Mary Denise Lance was described by those who knew her best as a loving and caring woman who had plenty of friends and family around her. The Lance family were described as tight-knit, with Mary's mother, Anita, describing her daughter as a well-liked young woman in the community of Marshall, Michigan. Mary had a connection with Marshall. It was where she'd grown up and experienced all of her major life events. So when her family told them that they were planning to move to California in 2004, she told them that she was staying put. Her family moved to California with the 39-year-old, her fiancé Chris Pratt, and Mary's two children staying behind in Marshall, Michigan. 
Mary was an adult and was more than capable of looking after herself, and her family had no worries about her or her welfare. Just months after they made the big move west, the lands were struck by a tragedy that has continued to haunt him for over 18 years. When the phone rang at their new home in California on March 14, 2004, the family had no idea that the details of the call would turn their lives upside down. Chris had called the lands, asking them if Mary was there or if, in fact, they had heard from her at all. Chris, Mary's fiancé, went on to add that he had not seen her since March 12, 2004, when she had walked out of the home located in the 1200 block of Arm Street in Marshall, following an argument from around 10 to 10.30 p.m. Chris would later tell investigators that Mary was wearing medical scrubs and a leather jacket and had taken her purse, but not her phone or her car keys. With this information, Mary's family, more specifically Mary's brother, Mike, decided to call the Marshall Police Department to report his sister missing. He later told NBC News, he, meaning Chris, called us in California and wanted to know if we had Mary. With the missing person report filed, the Marshall Police Department began their search for Mary, and naturally, they zeroed in on Chris. In an investigation like this, the husband, wife, or spouse, or boyfriend, or girlfriend is usually the first one to be looked at. While investigators were interviewing Chris and Mary's family members, another team of officers set about retracing Mary's last steps. They managed to find CCTV footage from March 12, 2004 that showed Mary at the Marshall Party Store at around 6.30 p.m. According to reports, Mary had headed to the store before agreeing to meet Chris at a nearby tanning salon. Employees and witnesses at the tanning salon confirmed that Chris and Mary did pop into the store and that the two were arguing. We do not know whether Mary made it home, and the next piece of information that is officially reported in Mary's case comes later that evening. As reported by NBC Dateline, on the night of March 12, 2004, Mary was due to meet with a friend. However, when the friend turned up at her house, guess who she was greeted by? Chris Pratt. Chris told the friend that Mary could no longer make it, and the friend drove away. Where was Mary at this point? Was she even in the house? Armed with this information, the Marshall Police Department kept digging at Chris, trying to get more information out of him, but he gave up nothing. A dog unit was brought in to search for Mary, and the dogs managed to follow her scent to a motel, but nothing was ever uncovered. The information that has been made publicly available in Mary's case is rather limited, and her parents and family have been critical of the Marshall Police Department's initial response and investigation into Mary's disappearance. According to a post to the subreddit r slash unsolved mysteries, March 14th at around 1.30 a.m., there's an 11-minute phone call between Christopher Pratt and Sergeant Tim Bryant of the Marshall PD. Pratt called Bryant. Unfortunately, we have not been able to find any articles to back up this claim as of yet. We also found another interesting clue in Mary's case, taken from a Fox 17 article written in 2014. To add context to the situation, Jim Carlin is a private investigator who was hired by Mary's family to assist them in the search war. According to Carlin, Chris was last seen at a flea market, trying to sell the brown leather jacket that he reported Mary was last seen in when she left home. Carlin also alleges that the ex-boyfriend was also in possession of Mary's birth certificate, something she carried with her always. The jacket was apparently recovered and handed over to the Marshall Police Department, with one source reporting that it was later conveniently lost. The search for Mary has continued over the years, and her family and Jim Carlin have never given up hope. In 2019, a search was conducted in Calhoun County after tips were received by the Venus Foundation and the Canine Human Remains Detection Group stating that Mary's body was buried there. Unfortunately, no remains were found at the site, and Mary's case quickly ran cold again. Eight years prior to this, Mary had been declared deceased in absentia by a judge in Michigan, with Marshall Police Deputy Chief McDonald telling a judge that they had no evidence to suggest that Mary was still alive. Even with all these leads and searches, Mary's family are still no closer to laying her to rest. For them, it is the not knowing that hurts the most. While Chris, Mary's fiancé, has never been officially named as a suspect, he is the main person of interest in Mary's case. In 2007, Chris was arrested for assaulting his girlfriend and holding her against her will. For this, he was sent to prison, 
and was not paroled until 2013. Then, in 2018, Pratt made the headlines once again after he was accused of assaulting a minor in Albion, Michigan. In 2021, Pratt was acquitted of these charges and currently remains a free man. According to the Marshall Police Department, Chris was cooperative at first. However, as the investigation went on, he appeared to be less willing to get involved. As previously stated, Chris Pratt is not a suspect, merely a person of interest, and the Marshall Police Department, the Michigan State Police, and Mary's family will continue their pursuit of justice. Mary Denise Lands was last seen on March 12, 2004, as she reportedly left her home on the 1200 block of Arms Street in Marshall, Michigan. Mary is described as a white female with brown hair and brown eyes. She stands 5 foot 6 inches tall, weighs 160 pounds, and has both of her ears and her belly button pierced, and she also has a scar on her left arm from a polio vaccination. Mary also has a distinctive brown birthmark on her buttocks, wears reading glasses, and may also use the name Mary Marshall or Mary Denise Marshall Lands. According to her fiancé, she was last seen wearing a light blue hospital scrub shirt with either a teddy bear or Spongebob print, dark blue scrub pants, tennis shoes, and a brown leather jacket. Anyone with any information is asked to please contact Deputy Chief Scott McDonald of the Marshall Police Department at 269-781-2569 and reference case number 1208-04. Little Marjorie West Four-year-old Marjorie West of Bradford, McKean County, Pennsylvania, was a bright and happy young child and was the light of her parents' lives. Having been born in 1934, Marjorie had no idea that much of her young life would be experienced through the lens of war, terror, and pain, or at least it would have if it hadn't been for her disappearance. While children in the U.S. were relatively safe, unlike their British counterparts, who often had to flee into the countryside to escape the hundreds of planes flying overhead, it in no way means that they were immune to the troubles of the outside world. Sunday, May 8, 1938, Mother's Day in America, would be one to remember, but for all the wrong reasons. The lives of the West family would be turned upside down, and now, as the 85th anniversary of Marjorie's disappearance is approaching in 2023, we are still no closer to the truth. Mother's Day, 1938, started out peacefully for the West. They donned their Sunday best and headed to the local church for a service. As the priest spoke passages from the Bible and hymns echoed through the halls, little Marjorie had one thing on her mind, the picnic. As people shuffled out of the church, the West got into their car and drove towards the White Gravel Creek area of the Allegheny Forest. As the car drove slowly along Chapel Fork Road, the West found their picnic spot, bringing the car to a gentle stop before letting the children out. The West weren't alone that day, with the Ackerlands also joining them for what should have been a peaceful afternoon. Blankets were thrown down, food was dished up, and the children ran around on the grass, eager to explore further in the creek and beyond. According to the Guardian newspaper, at around 3 p.m., Cecilia, Marjorie, and Dorothea's mother headed back to the car for a rest. No doubt the Mother's Day celebrations had been packed with activities, and Cecilia needed a few minutes to decompress. While their mother headed back to the car, their father got his fishing line ready to go and hunt for trout in the stream that runs through the creek. Not wanting to be left out, Marjorie and Dorothea asked if they could go and gather some wildflowers for their mother as a final Mother's Day present. Their father agreed and told them to be careful of hidden creatures that might jump out at them at any moment. Little did their father know that it wasn't what was hiding in the trees, but who was hiding in the trees that posed a threat to his daughters. The two little girls skipped happily over to the wildflowers, with 11-year-old Dorothea taking the lead and showing her little sister how to pick them and put them into a bunch. Dorothea also grabbed a handful of violets to add some vibrancy to her bunch and decided that she was going to head toward the car to give them personally to her mother. According to reports, Dorothea only turned her back for a matter of moments and as she turned back around to speak to her sister, she noticed that Marjorie was gone. Dorothea instantly cried out to her mom and dad, and within a matter of minutes, the West sped away in their car, looking for the nearest phone. For seven miles, their father drove the remaining family, 11-year-old Dorothea and 7-year-old Alan, along with his wife Cecilia, through the creeks and old roads. Eventually, they hit the town of Kane, where they were able to use a phone to alert the authorities. 
Within hours, squad cars had descended upon the once quiet White Gravel Creek area, and the search for little Marjorie began in earnest. In total, some 3,000 people turned up to help the West look for their daughter, and those in nearby towns were even given the day off to help look for the missing tot the next day. The community rallied together, hoping that Marjorie would be found somewhere within the wilderness, but unfortunately, no sign of her was found, even after thousands of people had scoured through the wilderness. When searchers stumbled across a freshly dug grave, their hearts sank into their stomach. Upon excavating the grave, however, they found a cask of wine had been buried there, and the search continued. Scent dogs were brought in to assist authorities, and they were able to follow Marjorie's scent to an abandoned cabin whose doors had been nailed shut. Again, this discovery chilled the searchers, but no sign of Marjorie was ever found in or around the cabin once they breached the door. The Wests and the Ackerlands were extensively interviewed along with other witnesses, and as these interviews were conducted, an interesting eyewitness account came about. According to this witness, they had seen two cars passing through the White Gravel Creek area on the day that Marjorie vanished. However, according to the Guardian newspaper, these cars were later ruled out, and the police determined that these sightings were not connected to Marjorie's disappearance. In the weeks following Marjorie's disappearance, searchers continued scouring the woods for the little girl, and her parents also remained in the area to search for her. Every effort was made to find Marjorie, but no trace of her has ever been found. This leads many to believe that Marjorie was taken from the area, but again, no solid evidence has ever been produced to back up this theory. According to the Charlie Project, Thomas West, a taxi driver in West Virginia, called investigators, claiming that he had seen a girl fitting Marjorie's description in a dark green sedan. An unidentified man was driving the car, and the little girl inside was crying. It would later transpire that this mystery man claimed the crying little girl was his own daughter and that he had tried to find a vacancy at a nearby motel. Nobody knows what became of this mysterious man nor the little girl, and the police have never been able to confirm whether this was Marjorie or not. Over the years, there have been hundreds of rumors and plenty of theories, both in papers and online. One bizarre theory is that Marjorie was taken to Canada by her family, but for what reason this familial abduction took place has not been stated. The two most prevailing theories are that Margie wandered off and died due to exposure, or she was kidnapped by someone else. There's little to no solid evidence in Marjorie's case, which makes it all the more difficult to investigate. Her family has never given up looking for her, and even with the passing of their parents and them going into their adulthood, her two siblings have never forgotten little Marjorie. Over the years, there have been sightings, reports, plenty of new witnesses that have come forward, but none of them has ever led to Marjorie. If still alive today, Marjorie would be 88 years old, and her family have gone for almost 85 years without ever knowing what happened to her. Marjorie is described as a white female with red hair and blue eyes. At the time of her disappearance, Marjorie was four years old, and age-progressed photos and photos of her sister Dorothea, to whom she bore a strong resemblance, are available online. Marjorie was last seen wearing a blue dress, navy blue mid-length coat with a collared pink edge, a red hat, and patent leather shoes. Anyone with any information, no matter how small it may seem, please contact Trooper Neil Ginther of the Pennsylvania State Police at 814-938-0535 and reference case C05-109-1880. Well, folks, there you have it. What do you think of these strange and creepy disappearances? As always, I look forward to reading your comments, but please remember to keep it friendly and respectful. Meanwhile, be good to yourselves and each other. Stay safe out there. As for me, I'll see you a little further on down the trail. I'm Steve Stockton, and I'll talk to you next time.